Mm. Excellent. Thank you, Trustee Jefferson. Is there a second, please? Second. Thank you, Trustee Bombardi. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Excellent. With that, then we will close out EPSL and Trustee Dickinson, I will turn it over to you for the board meeting. Thank you, uh, Megan. And thank you, Yasmin. That was very instructive. Um, okay, it's now 1.30. I think it's still 1.30. Yep, 1.30. And I just want to call the regular board meeting of trustees to order. We have a good group here. I want to thank everybody for committing their time to this, especially the trustees, but also all of the administrative and, and support staff that we have with us and faculty today. And anyone else who's watching us. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping. We do have a link to provide a public comment that is available on the agenda. Uh, it's published on the website and is on the link posted in the chat. Uh, thanks to Jen for taking care of that. Uh, we have approval of minutes scheduled for the December 6th meeting um, that was with your materials. Is Do I hear a motion to approve the minutes? <clears throat> I can do this one. Okay, second. Su Sue Zeller. Second. Has, okay, and who, so you made the motion and, for the second. Yeah. Somebody made the second. Shirley did. Shirley did. Oh, good, Shirley. Okay, any questions or corrections or any omissions on that? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes of December 6th for the board meeting, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we are now going to the report from the Finance and Facilities Committee, which met on December 13th. Um, I'm going to ask um, the CFO, Sharon Scott, to start with that. And if the chairman, David uh, Silverman, wants to. I, I believe that the chair is present and uh, he's prepared to speak. Okay, then trust me, you're the chair. He, he is indeed present. <laughs> um, we have uh, an abbreviated report. We did meet um, on December 13th, and Sharon uh, shared uh, the contents of that meeting in the, uh, the, the board package and uh, we would um, answer some questions if there are any, but other than that, we could go on to uh, the main meat of our report. But let me pause for a second and see if there are any questions um, with regards to the materials in the board package. Uh, I would foreshadow that uh, we have a meeting on February 7th. Uh, that will be a fairly significant meeting talking about uh, both the strategic uh, financial plan that we will be seeking to get approved by the trustees, as well as looking at some additional information about our facilities uh, planning, uh, which we also discussed at our last meeting. Um, if trustees are able uh, to carve out time um, for the seventh Finance and Facilities Committee meeting, that will be a very important meeting uh, with regards to transformation. So if you have the time, uh, we would love to see you there. Uh, questions with regards to the board materials? Um, hearing none or seeing no raised hands, um, I'd like to um, ask President John Mills to present um, the Russ and Amy uh, Dallas Endowment. Yes, I'm sorry I'm off screen. It says the host has blocked me, but I think you can all hear me. Um, Russ and Amy Bayless have uh, made a contribution, a sizable $50,000 to a scholarship they already had. Uh, now I can, you have the pleasure of my face now. Um, and uh, just a quick response, this is for students studying digital community communications entering their junior or senior year. Preference is given to out-of-state students. Uh, that's their choice. And uh, if they're not uh, three qualified students, then the scholarship funding 
to can go to a nursing student. And I would <clears throat> just like to say that this is from an alum from uh, 1986. He's been giving, they have been giving continuously. And again, a little tidbit is, uh, this was stimulated by our student phone reaching out to them. And all of a sudden he got the bug in his um, ear or wherever and said, yeah, I got to do more. And within the next day, he had committed the $50,000 to add to his endowment fund. So uh, we're very pleased with it. Any questions? Uh, the facilities, uh, Finance and Facilities Committee reviewed this request on our meeting on December 13th and agreed to um, recommend um, approval of this to the full board. And I would make that in the form of a motion. Do we have a second on that? I'll second. I'll second. Any more discussion or questions on the uh, Ballas endowment request? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor of accepting the um, Russ and Amy Ballas Endowment, please syndicate by saying aye. All right. All right. All right. Opposed? Um, I don't think anybody would be opposed to someone donating a substantial amount of money for our students. That's really a very nice story that the president of uh, NVU gave us. We appreciate their generosity. Um, so, so before we yield back to the chair, Sharon, I want to give you a second if you have anything to, to report on that I've missed. Uh, the only update, um, I know Catherine Levasseur has provided the board with an update regarding government affairs. As you know, uh, the governor did put forward his recommendation last week for budget. Um, we had, uh, we had last year, we had put forward a, a proposal, a proposed schedule for increases to our base appropriation to $48 million. And there is a very broad acknowledgement from the governor of that plan moving forward. And so his uh, appropriations uh, proposal is to increase by $5 million, which is consistent with the plan that we put forward last year. Um, we did, however, put forward our request when we proposed this year, uh, recognizing the unprecedented um, position that the state is in, moving to the full $48 million. And we will continue to move forward with that request, um, putting that forward. Um, but I just wanted to just bring that forward so that you're all aware that that work is ongoing. And we begin our first testimony with um, the Senate earlier later this week. Um, the only other item is that the governor's recommendation did not include big bridge funding. Um, which we had proposed and had a schedule for last year, that would be $14.9 million this year. We did make a request as part of our proposed proposal to the governor's office to bring forward and the full amount of bridge funding necessary for the remaining years of transformation. Again, that is something that we'll be discussing with the House and the Senate in the coming weeks. Any questions? Thank you, Sharon. Any questions on that? Hearing none. Oh, we did have an executive committee meeting on January 7th. Um, and uh, the report on that is that we received an update on planning for the spring semester in response to the Omicron variant of COVID-19. Uh, some of these plans have subsequently evolved following the meeting and the president's cannot provide an update on the response to the virus going with the return of students to campus where they provide the reports later. COVID has been a ma major topic over the past 18 months to two years, and this is um, almost two years and it continues. Uh, we also have uh, additional information on the discussions with unions over the COVID policy for employers, employees. Uh, there was a Supreme Court decision on that about employees, uh, employers with over hundred employees. And um, we also received an update on transformation expenditures and that is publicly available and posted on the website as part of the meeting materials. We'll hear later, I believe, from others about the continuation of the transformation. Uh, we have a report from the nominating committee. Uh, Adam Grinald, the trustee, is uh, going to provide a report on that. We had a meeting January 10th. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, the nominating committee met on uh, January 10th to consider recommendations for the board appointed position. Um, and the nom nominating committee today is, is bringing forward a, a recommendation or nomination, if you will, to elect trustee Silverman for that position. Uh, in addition to that recommendation, uh, the, the nominating committee is, as your packet um, identifies, uh, the members committed their continued uh, interest in serving another term should the board choose to elect uh, those folks to the nominating committee again. Okay, so we need a motion on the floor to elect David Silverman to accept the re recommendation from the nominating committee to elect David Silverman to serve a second term, term as a board elected trustee. Do I hear a motion? I'll make that motion. Okay, Adam Grinald and seconded by Megan Clover, the vice chair. Okay, any discussion or any questions on David's nomination? Uh, I would just say that during the discussion, I think we all expressed our appreciation and gratitude uh, that he was willing to serve and I'm happy to have him offering his name up for this. Any others? Hearing none, uh, all those in favor of re-electing David Silverman to a second term uh, as a board member, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, David. We know that you're doing a great job. We really, really appreciate your efforts and uh, you are a valuable member of our board. Thank you very much. Well, um, thank you. And I just, you know, our job is not done yet. No, that's for sure. <laughs> thank you. Okay, Adam, we have the nominations then for the um, continuing members of the nominating committee that the board elects. Yes, uh, I don't know. Shall I read uh, names to include myself for that recommendation? How would you like to proceed? Yeah, that would be good. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the current members of the nominating committee are Adam Grinold, Janet Bombardier, uh, Lynn Dickinson acting as ex officio, and Bill Leppert, all of whom um, have indicated they would serve again, and I would make that nomination. Do I have a second? Uh, Mary, okay, Mary, uh, several people seconded. We'll take Mary's, Mary Moran's. Uh, okay, we have uh, three members of the committee and, and um, an ex officio is the trustee chair. Um, does anybody have any questions or questions or discussion on that? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor of accepting the recommendation from the nominating committee for the other, for the new continuing members of the nominating committee, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? I want to thank all of you for serving on that. Adam, thank you for being the chair. And um, I guess we won't have to do this again for another year, we hope. Um, Okay, we have uh, Wilson Garland, who is our project manager, director of transformation projects to give an update on the ongoing transformation work. Thank you. Let me just share my screen here. Okay, is everybody able to see my transformation update screen? Okay. All right, well, this, this month we have a, a brief update just to make sure that the, the board has updated information on our progress to date, as well as other areas of priorities that we're focusing on as we move the transformation work ahead. Uh, quick summary of progress. We have the student experience and academic operations teams that have identified and prioritized their design projects. That doesn't mean that we've uh, prioritized every single project, but we've identified the ones that uh, need to get started right away and, and have uh, significant contingencies with the other work that's, that's happening. Uh, the administrative operations teams uh, are beginning to transition from discovery to design. Uh, we've had uh, two of the teams go through their discovery process already, and we have the remaining coming up here. Um, the workforce development team is engaging in some visioning work and, and other uh, work as part of their discovery, and we'll have some more update on that coming up here. Um, we also have some significant uh, core system projects uh, that are kicking off 
um, that are significant and that Slade and Colleague are two of the, the systems that we rely on for a lot of the work that we're doing. Um, and they're kicking off uh, process um, reviews as part of the design work. Uh, so that's a, a critical milestone because a lot of the, the work that we have been doing in terms of discovery and design is dependent on those systems. Uh, and you can see down at the bottom there how we we have staggered out the where the different core teams are and related to the uh, overall pro process that we use for the project management. For the academic and student experience teams, we're in the process of transitioning from discovery and into design and really taking into account a lot of the the feedback from the sponsors as it relates to the operational vision of what we need to build as we get to Vermont State University. Uh, the sponsors and stakeholders are continuing to work together to put more definition around the hybrid university concept <clears throat> um, that's needed really to inform the design work and also organizational planning uh, that will come out of the design work as well. We have uh, the leadership team engaging in uh, training related to the DEI framework. Um, and completing a self-assessment of the aspects of that framework that are most related to leadership and strategy. Um, and that work then will guide the, the work that's happening uh, with the teams and design. Um, we're also conducting uh, some facilitated discussions to infuse the work of strategic thinking and data analysis and best practices into the work that we're doing on the teams as it relates to their design. Um, and I think we've had discussions in this group uh, in the past specifically related to the importance of financial modeling and financial analysis that's part of the work that we need to do on design. Um, and uh, Lit Tyler's leading that work for us, but we've also engaged uh, some contract resource to help with that work. Um, and that's really critical just from a capacity standpoint as we have so many different pieces that we're trying to do that analysis on. And, and making sure that we have a common framework and a common process for how to implement that work is really important. Uh, an update on, on the risks and dependencies. <clears throat> and I've shared these three areas before, so I'm just providing a quick update on, on each. Um, we're completing the first draft of the substantive change proposal for uh, NECHI, our accreditor, uh, for submission in March. Um, so that is continuing progress on that uh, important um, dependency in, in the work that we're doing. Also, uh, Yasmin reported earlier in EPSL on the progress that's being made with the faculty assembly and federation leaders uh, reaching agreement on some really key uh, schedule elements and, and milestones for approving the program, as well as moving forward on their governance planning. Um, and she talked about those two different pieces of, of faculty uh, governance is really important in the work that we're doing. So some great progress on that, um, but we're continuing to, to monitor that as part of the risks and dependencies that are part overall for, for transformation. Um, and then finally, you know, we talked at a previous meeting about some capacity constraints as it relates to design and development um, and the work that's needed there. I talked about adding some resource to the some temporary resource in the financial analysis area, um, but we've also brought on some technical consultants and temporary contractors and other areas to help with that work. Um, and we'll be talking a little bit more about the, the Slate uh, project and the Colleague project, which are two of our big systems projects there um, a little bit later. In terms of, <clears throat> in terms of academic operations, um, the key priorities here reflect a lot of the things that you heard earlier from Yasmin. Uh, faculty approval of the optimized programs uh, with the high level information that's needed to support recruitment and the broader systems projects that I talked about. Um, that's really a high priority there and that um, many of the other teams are, are working on projects that require some of that information. Uh, submitting the substantive change uh, request to uh, NECHI in March is obviously uh, a high priority and a lot of work happening uh, on that currently. Um, and then finalizing the academic organization and administration structure related to the programs, departments, schools. You know, we've talked about how important that is to the work that we're doing on transformation. So that's obviously a high priority. Um, and then collaboration with faculty leaders on programs, governance, and the policies needed 
to support the student experience and the academic experience for students. Um, those are all high priority items. Um, in terms of project highlights, I just wanna bring forward a couple that, that really are significant in the work that's been done and, and really have a, a broad impact on what we're doing. Um, you know, Yasmin talked about the, the common time block schedule that's being used for fall of, of 2022. Um, and that sounds like a, a simple thing, but it's really a significant thing when it comes to how we align our uh, courses and programs moving into 2023 and, and giving ourselves the opportunity to uh, get that work done. Um, also, the general education program uh, mission, vision, and goals that have been drafted, um, it's called Connections. And, and I think that that element is really an important aspect since all of the programs that we've talked about from optimization share the, uh, the general education program as well. So those are two highlights. Um, and I'll just make a, a general comment that obviously I'm, I'm presenting the, these core team updates, but this is reflective of uh, tremendous work that's being done in this case with Yasmin and, and the academic operations team and uh, the other teams as I'm presenting them. So the student experience team, uh, the key priorities here, we're obviously bringing three separate admissions and enrollment departments together as one. Um, and that group has been working very well together to, to focus on the areas that are high priority for them from a rec recruitment standpoint for 2023. Um, we also are looking at some multimedia marketing and communications to build awareness under uh, one consistent brand. Um, and that's something Given the, the way that the enrollment cycles work, it's really a high priority item for us here in the, in the near term to be prepared once we have uh, some additional uh, elements to communicate there. Also the website and infrastructure to support the application and admissions processes for fall of 2023. Um, you know, Slate is part of that, uh, but then there's other pieces that, that fit in with the um, applicant and enrollment uh, infrastructure. Um, and then completing a tuition evaluation study and uh, recommended approach for academic year 2023-24. Um, we have a group that's working on that and uh, ha has engaged a uh, resource to help us work through that and, and do the planning uh, that's needed to get to that recommendation. Um, in terms of highlights, here I'm highlighting the, the slate project and, and for just background, Slate is the system that we use for customer relationship management or you know, it's called CRM system. Um, and that really manages the communication primarily with applicants and people who are interested in, in joining our institutions. Um, <clears throat> so what's exciting about this is we're in the process right now of doing our business process review on this um, and looking for a singular uh, online application and admissions process with a consistent uh, perspective, student experience, uh, regardless of the campus or location. And, and the team's done some great work to uh, get to some common vision elements for what that uh, process will look like. But it's, it's work underway as, a, as this project uh, really unfolds. But we spent three days last week with people on campus really dissecting those different discovery elements and really trying to get clear on what those are. Um, also, the, the newly revised system will provide uh, some really great opportunities for data analytics and reporting that will help inform our strategic uh, direction and thinking um, as it relates to the, the new process around admissions. Um, and then we also have a tremendous opportunity um, in cooperation with the workforce development team um, to integrate the infrastructure that supports colleges and, and workforce development using the, the Slate tool. So that's something that we're um, really exploring to the fullest extent. And there's uh, members from the workforce team that are also part of that Slate project as well for that purpose. From an administrative operations team update, <clears throat> our key priorities here are really focusing on the backend processes that are dependencies for academic operations and student experience. Um, that doesn't mean that we won't be getting the other uh, administrative operations consolidation work done, but it's really reflecting the high priority that we have in getting Vermont State University up and running um, effective for the 2023-24 uh, academic year. 
Um, and then we're prioritizing data definitions and architecture during our systems development projects, really with the idea. And I know we've had discussions on um, our accountability dashboard and other things in the past, and it's really making sure that we've got the data elements within our infrastructure to support um, that sort of reporting, both at a strategic level as well as an operational level as we think about the work ahead. Um, the project that I wanted to highlight here is the Colleague project. And again, Colleague is the uh, product that we use for our enterprise uh, resource planning system, our enterprise system. Um, and that encompasses the student information system, it encompasses finance, and encompasses a lot of the back end processes that are necessary for running the universities. Um, so from this perspective, the, the project governance structure uh, is being put in place to make sure that we have uh, broad representation from the, the key business areas. Um, we are doing a thorough custom code review. I think many of you are familiar with the fact that we have a lot of customization that's been built into Colleague over the last 20 years and uh, to accomplish the consolidation of the universities into Vermont State University many of those customizations need to be addressed. Um, but in doing that, it really allows us to uh, find better and more streamlined business processes um, and really set up for long-term agility as we're thinking about how this system will evolve over time. Um, and the key thing to highlight here is that business process review is really at the core of the strategy that we're using for colleagues. So. Uh, making sure that we're not just merging things together and implementing uh, bad processes, but really getting clear on what the best processes are uh, before we implement. And then finally, workforce development. Uh, this team is obviously the one that, that kicked off uh, last, and we're still in discovery stage here, um, and really trying to look for external examples and best practices as we think about what that work uh, looks like for us moving forward. We're sharing, creating a shared definition around workforce development. And I think that's one thing, not just within the team, but more broadly across the system. We've identified that a lot of people have different perspectives on what that means and, and how we get a common definition is really important. And along with that, applying a shared vision for what that means for uh, Vermont State University and Community College of Vermont, as well as the broader system and, and what things are available there. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we're really, as we are going through the work on our core systems, really looking to identify the areas where we should be using those core systems to support uh, the workforce development efforts as well. Um, and then we're identifying gaps and prioritizing opportunities for future development on the workforce development work. Um, in terms of highlights, just would want to uh, bring forward that we're um, We've gained a, a deeper understanding of all the current programs at each institution and the various stakeholders. I think that's been a, a, an initial win in terms of the work that's been done with the workforce development team is there's so many different things going on and, and really understanding where those synergies are and, and where the opportunities are moving forward. Um, we are defining the dependencies across the different institutions as well as more broadly across uh, the system. Um, and then working with the uh, legislature and communicating our vision around workforce development and a lot of the work that uh, Catherine is doing with the legislature there. So that's the workforce development update. Uh, just a, a quick update on this on the schedule and, and what the um, future here looks like. I think the, the key thing to recognize is we've added some additional uh, cycles into the process as we work to prioritize the different projects within each of the uh, streams. Um, we've added some uh, design and development cycles for things that come later into the process, um, but we are uh, still on track and, and still looking to make sure that we're identifying those cross dependencies across the different core team areas as we go. From a transformation budget standpoint. And I know uh, there was some information shared on this uh, from the prior FNF meeting, um, but we just wanted to give a, a quick snapshot of what we've already allocated um, in terms of transformation spending and what we've already spent. 
Um, and this is across the different areas of project management, academic operations, administrative operations, student experience and workforce development. Um, there's also been some supplemental transformation spending on program optimization from the, the Davis Foundation, as well as uh, the facility studies, uh, which came from uh, the state capital. Um, so in total, uh, a little over half of our uh, budget for this year has been allocated already. And then if we look at spending by category, uh, you can see sort of how those different elements break out across consulting, marketing, personnel, stipends, and technology. And then looking at that graphically across the different uh, parts of transformation, you know, student experience is a big element of what we've done. Also academic ops already um, and project management and administrative ops and, and then workforce development, which is included in, in part in the unassigned um, are areas that we'll uh, build out more as we go. So finally, just to, to wrap up, there's still additional things for the, uh, the board to have in mind uh, as we move forward. I think uh, Trustee Silverman talked a little bit about the facilities strategic plan that's coming up and uh, also a review of space utilization plans. Um, and then obviously the presidential search uh, being a significant part of that work. Um, then we'll have tuition pricing models and additional uh, budget plans, et cetera, uh, to round out the, the rest of this year. So any questions? Many kept questions here. Um, um, Trustee Bombardier. Um, on the uh, workforce work, um, are there external stakeholders involved? Or is it just people from the colleges? Yeah, so um, right now we've started with the, the, the team that includes um, primarily people from our uh, institutions, although we do have some affiliated groups uh, that have been part of the discovery to date. Uh, and then we also have begun to, to reach out to some of our external uh, stakeholders as well. I'll let President Moulton uh, comment on this because I, I think there's some things in the works that would be helpful there to understand. Thanks, Wilson. Yes, as Wilson described right now, it's an internal group as we're trying to get to know, or, or now that we're getting at the end of getting to know what we're all doing, um, we intend to do a fair amount of external discovery. And then I have been contacted by some uh, external folks who would like to engage with us, but we really need to have more of a plan before we want to engage with them. But the, it is our intent to uh, engage with regional development corporations and others who are part of this work already, uh, just to get their input and understanding. Uh, regional development corporations, the, the remaining workforce investment boards that are active are all um, part of what we'll be engaging with at some point when we have something to propose and engage and uh, get their feedback on. But right at this point, we're not there yet. <clears throat> Yeah, it just, um, I don't know, Adam may have some comments as well, but uh, from my perspective uh, as an employer, there sure seem to be an awful lot of groups trying to address this and boy, is it all over the map. And if the state colleges could take that leadership role and we could get, maybe you can use some of us to try to get those other groups to follow you, but it seems like we're putting a lot of overhead into this issue with, as a state, not as the state colleges, but across the state of Vermont, we are putting significant overhead into this issue with very few results. Um, so good well, luck. I, and I, and I see your hands up, Adam, and I, uh, I know the RDCs have recently been working on a proposal for more of a coordinated workforce development system. Um, it's been something I've been asked on and off in my prior life. Um, 
working in state government, and I have some very strong feelings about that, but um, I don't know that it's the Vermont State College's role to solve the workforce development system problem for the state of Vermont. I think it's our role to be the service provider and training provider that's going to help meet those needs. But um, I think there are systems in place that can really coordinate the intel of you know, what the demand is and, and where, where we can go. But um, I'm always curious what others may think. And you may have some ideas on that, Adam. Yeah, I think uh, you know, th this is an interesting time that happens to coincide with the transformation. I think the, the sort of activity around the workforce development would be happening um, irregardless or regardless of this, but the opportunity for the state college system is, is a good one here. Um, mm -hmm. This will be a very active legislative session in workforce development because, of course, every legislator is hearing from their constituents the need and the importance of this across all industries, sectors. Um, and, you know, it's, it's as much a population problem as it is a workforce problem. Um, but nonetheless, we have to, I'm not gonna even say better align the system because there isn't really a true system. Um, you know, you've got federal funding coming into WIOA, which the, the state college system can access and, and help uh, upskill folks through that, those, those dollars. But then you have probably 95% of the other workforce challenges outside of WIOA. Um, and I think that's even an opportunity for the state college system here. So not to go too deep on workforce here for today's meeting, but I, I think ensuring that we engage those outside stakeholders sooner than later, getting folks to the table. There's, while there is a lot of folks in this, this sort of ecosystem, there's, there's only a handful who are um, statewide, who understand the, the statewide as it exists and, and maybe with the aspirational views of where it could go. So I think the state college system could create some good ballast um, for that, that conversation or that journey. Um, so looking forward to seeing what's coming in the future. I agree, Adam, and, and we're not gonna, yeah, we're not gonna solve the workforce systems problems for the state of Vermont, but we can, be a, a serious player and, and or continue to be a serious player um, in this arena. And you know, it, it's been eye-opening to me to better understand what all the various workforce development efforts and, and continuing ed efforts are around the system. And so, um, and I know some of them, every single one of them has utility, but I know there are some that could, could be expanded and grown tremendously. So to meet some of these needs, but I also think you nailed the head, um, hammer on the, got the nail on, hit the nail on the head in that this isn't just a workforce problem, it's a population problem. Um, and we, we just don't have enough people um, to educate and train or that want to be educated and trained in, in the various fields. So um, it's a multiple layered solution. Anyone else? I just like to state that as a member of the Commerce Committee some years ago, we tried to put together a list of all of the workforce development that existed in state government. Every department and agency in state government has some form of workforce development, including human services and agriculture and education. And I mean, you name it, they've all got it. And it was impossible for us to do that. I mean, it really was. We brought in all kinds of people. Um, it's important. I think the important thing, I think uh, President Moulton brings up a really good point. We are the service and training provider. We provide the education where the seed money that the state gives us so that we can provide the training and education for Vermonters and provide a way to upskill their, their skills and their education and provide better and more high paying jobs, which will generate more revenue organically and which will help employers grow and, and expand, which will increase their revenues to the state organically without having to raise taxes on the same old people. But it is a population issue. It's a work, you know, we used to look for jobs. Where are the jobs coming from? Now we look for where are the people coming from? Where are the employees coming from? And we have a lot of population that doesn't pay, doesn't participate in the higher education, continuing education or opportunities that we do provide and others provide. So. I think the important thing for us to remember is we're the seed money that enables all of them, everyone, to have better opportunities and to raise more revenue for the state by increasing productivity. 
my speech for the day. Anyone else? Thank you. Yeah, uh, Lynn, um, unrelated to workforce, I just, I had an observation in, in reviewing the, the slide deck there and the stipends that are, are paid out. Um, I'm just curious, are, my thinking as I saw that as a reminder of how much extra work everybody is putting into this yes. and, and what they're being asked to do to help plan and execute on the transformation. I, I can only imagine that the available stipends is a fraction of the actual time and effort. Um, and I wonder if, if there's any tracking of that time and effort and be above and beyond the stipends. And, you know, I think as, as trustees, I think it would be helpful for us to know, mm -hmm. quantify somehow above and beyond and to be able to be reminded of, of that effort on a, on a regular basis to just continue to understand and appreciate all that that's going into this. That's a good point. Does uh, Sharon or Wilson have any, or the chancellor have any thoughts on that? I was, yeah, I was going to su suggest um, that uh, Sharon can weigh in here in terms of the stipends. We did issue a series of stipends um, in December and the way it was done was to take into account what, what teams people were on. It wasn't, it was a flat amount. If you were on a sub team, if you were on a core team, it wasn't, you know, the individual effort that had gone into it. Um, the other piece is that we have tried to provide a backfill and additional support as well as some um, salary, uh, additional salary support for people that are really taking on a lot more than, than um, you know, than their historical job, uh, job responsibilities. But Sharon, I'll let you weigh in too. You did all the work on the stipend, so. Well, it, it was a, it was certainly a team effort. Um, we are not tracking uh, specific hours that individuals are working on the transformation related items. What we do though is track um, the assignments that individuals um, are working with. So for example, if someone is assigned to three different teams as a team member, um, we're keeping track of that. If they're serving as a team lead, if they're serving as a resource to a project. Um, and we are keeping track of that. And that's the, the data that we used and actually to calculate the stipends. So depending on if you were a team member, a team lead, a core team lead, um, and the number of teams that you belonged to, we calculated an amount for that. Um, we didn't do it based on the specific effort because as we all know, some individuals are able to schedule their work in a way that allows them to divide their work more evenly and fairly than others, um, but instead did it as a flat amount. It's certainly something that we can continue to track as we move forward. Um, because it is really an important thing for us to acknowledge. We are really cognizant that um, the goodwill of our colleagues is really what's helping us be successful, but there is only so much that individuals can do. And that's why, as Sophie noted, um, looking at areas where um, backfill is necessary or reassigning staff completely to a task will be important, particularly as we move into the design efforts. Yeah, I would say that's probably my biggest concern is burnout and just how much people have on their plates um, and trying to be mindful of that. But being mindful of it and being able to do something practically to two two different things. Right. So the will is there, but but trying to figure out the best way to manage it, um, you know, is, is a constant challenge and trying to make sure that we're not overwhelming people because that's not going to do us any favors in the long run. Uh, Wilson, do you have something to add to that? No, thanks. I, I thought that was a good summary. Good. Thank you. Yes, that was a good question. And I think we would like to continue to be aware of that because it's important for the people who are doing the work and, and for the institution as a whole, the institutions, all of them. Um, is there anything, any other questions on transformation from anyone? Any questions or suggestions or anything? Seeing none, we're going to go on to the presidential reports. Um, COVID has been an ongoing continuing issue and we're going to ask for a report on how things are going with enrollment, COVID, whatever else there is going on. And I invite questions from the trustees, but we'll start with President Joyce Judy, CCV. Thank you, Chairman Dickinson. And it's a pleasure to um, talk with you just for a couple of moments um, and give you an update on where we are with CCV. 
Um, CCV began its spring semester today. So we are underway. Um, and I have to say, I am pretty pleased and pretty surprised we are up significantly. We are up 3% in our head count and we are up 4% in our course placements. So I wanna remind you, we have nearly 5,000 students who are enrolled. So up 3% is not insignificant. So we are, our enrollment is strong. And just as a reminder, we were up, this isn't, this is, we were up last spring as well, and last spring and fall. So this isn't, we are seeing an uptick from even during COVID, so it's great. I wanna um, just comment on our enrollment pattern though, because um, you know I think we've been reading a lot in the media about this pent up energy for being having in-person classes. And I can tell you, we're not seeing that at CCV and most community colleges are not seeing that. We actually um, ended up, you know, we offer, we put out our course list with courses and also the format. And so students get to choose what courses, what format, um, they register by sections. And we actually ended up adding a lot of online sections and canceling a lot of on ground sections because people were not enrolling. So our mix um, this um, spring, 72% um, of our classes are strictly online. Another 7% are synchronous and online. And only 13% of our classes, 13% of our course placements um, are, are um, in person. That's a, and it's about 15, 18% of our class offerings are all in person. So it's an interesting time um, for us. Um, you know, we, before pre-COVID, we were about 45% of our classes were online. Um, now we're at 72%. Um, what will that look like? when hopefully we settle out from COVID and all of that. But it is something we're, we're keeping very close tabs on. And also, because I do work with some of the national committees that I'm on, um, other community colleges are seeing the same, the same kind of behavior. So we're watching that closely. I will um, also just in terms of COVID, um, just as a reminder in the fall, we did not require students um, to be vaccinated, but starting this semester, we did require all students who are taking any component of an in-person course. So if they are doing a hybrid or in-person or whatever, they have to be vaccinated. And um, I'm pleased to say that we had very little pushback um, and very few requests for exemptions. So um, we are happy with that. And as we are with, as the VSC and Sophie, I'm sure will be giving you an update on this, uh, we are strongly recommending all faculty and staff um, to be vaccinated. So I feel like we're doing as best we can to manage um, in the COVID environment. And of course we are requiring um, masks anytime you're inside um, at a CCV location and also um, just trying to make sure we are practicing as responsible as we can social distancing. Um, one of the, probably the, in addition to our spring semester starting, the other thing I just want to call it, um, trustees attention to is we are hosting our, our NECHI um, reaccreditation visit March 13th to the 16th. Um, as people know, uh, people who have been involved in um, this reaccreditation process from the trustee standpoint, this is a huge lift for colleges. Um, it's about an 18 month process. And um, the end of, we are, we are submitting this week our self-study and all the required documentation. And I just wanna give a shout out to so many people. Um, we had more than 70 faculty, staff and students involved in all the standards and putting together the report. Um, it's been a heavy lift just as the other schools have gone through it as well. But just acknowledge that and just thank our staff and faculty and students who have participated in this. And then the only other thing I, I found this really interesting because we have really tried to put a, a, a over the last two or three years, a real um, emphasis on professional development for faculty and staff. And, um, and we've really tried to take advantage of the COVID environment and do a lot of virtual trainings. And I just was looking at um, from our self-study, we have done 60 professional development seminars for faculty in the past 12 months. That's not insignificant. And we've had hundreds of faculty attending. 
And so there are some silver linings with the COVID environment. And the second piece I would say is a silver lining is we have for the past, since um, the fall of 2020, we have been doing all our new student orientations virtually. And um, this spring, you know, we do them at different times. We do evening, we do daytime, we do lunchtime, which is interesting. And we do early morning. And um, this, this spring we saw more than between 400 and 500, I don't know the exact number, between 400 and 500 new students attended one of those orientations. And I can tell you that's by far more than we would have been able to touch had we had in-person new student orientations um, at, the, um, at our centers. And they're quite rich. We use the breakout rooms. They get the breakout with their advisor. They do a whole section um, with, we have um, current students talking to students. Um, and they also get to break out. They do two breakouts, one by advisor. So it's by discipline, I mean, by discipline. And then secondly, by advisor. So it's a really um, interactive time, but we're managing some, like the last one, we had 180 students on it. Um, but it's, we have it down and it's pretty um, impressive. If any trustee would ever like to attend one, I would be more than happy to invite you into, into the fray. So with that, I will stop and um, entertain um, any questions? Any questions for Joyce Judy? I have one question. Yes, uh, Joyce. I'd just like to say you're doing a lot of professional development and getting all of those folks to show up. That's a job. What type of uh, professional development? And if so, that did any of it include DEI in any? Yes, it did. Oh, it did. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Do you know about how many you had that dealt with diversity, equity, and inclusion? Uh, you know, Trustee Jefferson, I don't, but that has been a major thrust. Um, and what's really nice about the faculty professional development, oftentimes it's faculty talking to other faculty. So we did, um, I think there were four or five that were specifically focused on, on um, DEI components. But then I would also say that I think one of the things we've really tried to do um, through our DEI committee is to really um, look at all of the, a, a, a lot of issues, a lot of decisions. How do we look at it through um, the, a DEI lens? And so it's, um, you know, people looking at um, course descriptions, how are they incorporating um, conversation into classes, um, all of those things, language, um, how do you build trust in, um, and, and, um, build a trusting environment so people feel like they can talk about things. Those are all things that um, we have been including in those conversations. Great, thank you. I have just one other question. You yep. said that 72% of your students, uh, your classes are online. Uh, what is the retention or attrition rate for your students uh, in, the, in these courses? Our retention rate with online, um, we track that really closely because um, just, just as a point, um, we have been doing online classes since 1996. So this has been a very significant piece for us. Our retention rate in online is equal to our retention rate on ground. It's about 80%. And um, one of the things that we do do that is sort of our niche in online is our classes are really small. Our classes are the same size online as they're on ground. So our classes, our online classes are no bigger than 20, which is you know very different than most models nationwide. And so, and the other two other components to our online classes is we take, we take attendance in online. So people have to participate a couple of times a week. It may be in a discussion board or it may be something, but they have to participate. And we do track attend, faculty, faculty track attendance, and then they upload attendance. So the advisors can reach out to students if they're not attending. So we, um, we try to help we know that um, what's really important in online is um, for those of us that may not be as disciplined as we should, yeah. we need to build in guardrails to help develop that discipline. And so that's something that um, we work on really closely. So one of the things in our faculty contract is faculty are required to take attendance. And that attendance, um, when a student is missing class, it's fed back to our advisors who then reach out to students. So our whole goal, and this is what we talk about a lot in our orientation, is 
it's a partnership. We want, they want to be successful and we want them to be successful. So it's a long way to say our retention rate is something we, we pay attention to a lot in online because it has grown to be, if someone had ever said to me back in 1996 that, well, pre-COVID that almost 50% of your classes would be online, I would have thought they were like, I don't know. I can't, I wouldn't have been able to believe it, but it is something. And I think it's the success of our online courses and, um, and how students do in subsequent courses. And what's more important is how they do when they transfer. Um, you know, just as a reminder, CCV is the largest cohort of transfer students to UVM and they're most successful. So not only within the system, but outside of the system, they do well. So I'm, I'm very proud of what we do in online. And I'm very impressed, President Judy. Thank you. And you're doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. That is helpful. What about uh, President Tom Mouse Pugh from Castleton University? Yeah. I, I, so I apologize. I clicked my uh, <clears throat> icons a little too rapidly there. Thank you, uh, Chair Dickinson. So uh, CCV, uh, very smartly, um, begins its semester about a week or so after we do. And this is really helpful for Castleton students that if they're unable to get a particular class they need at the last minute, um, it's easy for them to pick up a CCV course. So this is our second week of classes today. I believe Sophie shared a campus by campus COVID update with the board in terms of what our plans were. Uh, we did opt for remote classes for week one of the semester. So that was last week. So as to spread out the expected impact of the Omicron infections to reduce potential strain on personnel and services and mitigate any potential impact on local healthcare providers who are struggling with high hospitalization and ICU rates and staffing shortages due to employees testing positive. Uh, the week of remote classes appears to have gone well. We're now back fully in person. It's great to see the full parking lots and student crowds migrating across campus to go to and from classes. Since January 1, approximately 25 people have tested positive. Very few of those are still in isolation. We've had athletes back on campus since December 28th. So it's not that all the students arrived a week ago. They've been coming in in stages for uh, three weeks or more. Uh, I will update you while we're on athletics. <clears throat> Just a reminder, athletics, we have approximately 550 to 600 varsity student athletes about 35% of our undergraduate students. It's a big part of the Castleton experience, both for participants and spectators. The team that came back on December 28th was our wrestling team. And if you wanna think about nightmares, think about a very large wrestling team amidst COVID. And not only that, but on December 28th, they got on a bus and went to Florida for a national uh, set of competitions. They spent a few days in Florida, turned around, came back. One member of the team tested positive during the entire trip, um, which is just the discipline and the care of the athletes and the coaches is impressive. Our teams have been engaging in competition right along. Wrestling, by the way, is 11 and two overall as a team. They're tremendously powerful. Uh, had two first place finishes while they were in Florida. Men's alpine skiing uh, won their first two events out of eight teams, came in fourth in the third out of eight teams and won the fourth. Women's alpine has won all four of their events. They're phenomenal. And men's and women's Nordic, they're off to a good start, consistently placing racers in the top 10 spots. It's a little petty on my part, but as a former faculty member at Dartmouth, which has a nationally ranked uh, Nordic team, when I see the Castleton team beat 
there's team, I, I get a little thrill. Uh, they've also been outpacing UVM and Middlebury. It's always nice to serve the public good in such uh, ancillary ways. Basketball has been struggling a little. Men's basketball, five and 11. The women have not, they're at eight and five. I watched an excellent women's game against Eastern Connecticut two weeks ago before we put a moratorium on fans. I'll get to that in a minute. Men's ice hockey, four and 14 and one, and women's is six, seven and two. There seems to be a pattern. The women's teams do a little better. I'm sure it's completely coincidental. Uh, everyone likes to win, but the emphasis at Castleton is on the athlete as a student. It's on their personal development. In the fall of 2021, all teams averaged a 3.0 GPA or higher. That's higher than the Castleton University average, and it's really unusual in college sports. Our student athletes are unambiguously students first, although athletics is a strong part of their experience and helps them develop fully as people. We did ban fans at events last week in line with the first week of classes going online. Effective today, fans are once again welcome to attend all athletic events. It will be great to have them back. I want to shift to regional accreditation. Uh, for those unfamiliar with the concept, the federal government, the U.S. Department of Education, has basically uh, sent, allocated its duties to verify that institutions comply with U.S. Department of Education regulations and thus are entitled to receive Title IV grants through a system of regional accreditors. Ours is NECHI, New England. Uh, Commission of Higher Education. We had our 10-year visit in uh, October, as CCB is having theirs in March. I've seen the draft report. We're awaiting the final report. The draft report is strongly positive. It listed 23 areas of commendation in its summary. It noted 13 concerns, none of them major, at the exit report, the team stated that Castleton had met all nine of the NECHI standards. So on April 21st, I will meet with the commission in outside of Boston, uh, spend about an hour and a half answering questions. In about a week after that, we will be notified of NECHI's uh, final determination of the status of our accreditation going forward. It all looks very good at this point in time. I want to pause for a second. There are a couple other things I'd like to touch on, but I want to see if there's questions, anything I've covered to date. No questions for President. Okay. It looks right. like you're all set to go. All right. Enrollment. Um, the enrollment numbers I'm going to give you are as of January 20th, and numbers will continue to shift over the next two weeks. For example, headcount went up five over the weekend as students sort out their status and uh, pay bills and all those kinds of things. Our headcount as of Friday was 1,894. Our FT was 1,567. Uh, our enrollment did go up about one and a half percent this fall. Uh, it's been doing quite well. We are about 20 or so below our uh, budget projection for spring, but for various reasons I'll get into in a minute, uh, that has not had a negative impact on the budget. The headcount, when you break it down, 40% uh, of our undergraduates are out of state students. That's 615. 910 are Vermonters. Our graduate students split into two groups. There are the matriculated students that are in a degree program, a master's, MA or MS. And then there are the Center for Schools students. These uh, are generally professional educators. They're receiving credit for graduate study. Um, it's to its relicensure, it's to its professional development. It advances them on their collective bargaining pay scale. 
uh, but they're not necessarily matriculated in a degree program. So our graduates break out at about 50-50 matriculated, 180, and about 50% unmatriculated, 189 Center for Schools. Center for Schools does educate about 2,000 students a year through their programs. So a pretty important part in the professional development of educators in the state of Vermont. And our graduate students, whether for Center for Schools or matriculated, comprise about 20% of our income. Fall 22 admissions, never too early to check track, but these numbers are early. Applications are up 21%. We have about 1,200 applications as of last Friday versus 1,600 last year. Our deposits are up 110%. We have 42 deposits versus 20 last year. These are very preliminary numbers subject to change over time, but it's always good to have better applications uh, early in the process. Our budget. <clears throat> We went into the academic year projecting a budget deficit of about 8.9 million. That has been significantly altered. At this point, we're projecting about a $4.7 million uh, deficit. That's a $4.2 million swing to the positive. Uh, that's partly because salaries and benefits are down. That's partly because of um, Empty positions we haven't filled or positions we've tried to fill but been challenged because of a very difficult hiring time. But tuition fees and room and board are all up. So I had mentioned earlier that our spring FT enrollment is slightly below where we had projected. But given the makeup of the student scholarship aid, how many of them are out of state, in state, et cetera, the revenue is actually up. So I will pause there. Uh, any questions? Yeah, just a quick question. I'm curious. It's it, it's interesting to compare year over year uh, to last year because there's so much uncertainty with the pandemic. But what would you typically expect for like deposits to be this time, say pre-pandemic? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. Um, and it, what, the other variable, the pandemic is an important one. The other variable is a few years ago, we contracted with EAB as a consultant to advise on our recruitment uh, procedures. And they, they project and advise not only on uh, scholarship aid in locations, but they also help us with um, targeted activity, optimizing some of our systems. And that includes how we utilize slate messaging, sequencing of the messaging. So there's a lot of variables that have changed aside from COVID. Um, the, where we are in applications currently is a slightly ahead of where we would have expected to be in the last few years. Other questions? Okay, if there are no other questions, is there anything else that anyone wants to add to this? Okay, is that it, Tom, or we have anything else? <laughs> well, there's a lot going on. You're all welcome to stop down and visit anytime. And we are fully operational. So come watch an athletic contest, take in a play, music, et cetera. But uh, no, things are going great. It's really good to have the semester underway. Thank you for your time. Thank you. It, sorry, could I just quickly, um, Tom, do you want to just share what you, the transformation updates that you're doing as well on the campus? Because I think that would be of interest to the trustees. Yeah, sure. So uh, starting the week before classes, <clears throat> I initiated an all-campus Zoom call for all staff and faculty every Thursday from 2 to 3 p.m. Uh, so we're, we've had two of them now. 
we had 69 people on the first one, 63 on the second. And we do updates on where we are in the transformation process, different team members report out, and we take questions, answer people's uh, concerns, uh, bring that information back to the teams and the team members. We have approximately 30 Castleton employees are serving on one or more transformation teams. This is also a good opportunity for them to share what they're doing on their individual teams. So it helps uh, network information across the teams. And uh, it's been very helpful. The feedback I'm getting is strongly positive. We will continue doing it as long as people continue showing up. It seems very helpful. Thank you, that sounds interesting. Good luck with it. Any other questions? Uh, not seeing any, uh, we will move along to President John Mills, who is here for Northern Vermont University. Thank you, and uh, <clears throat> I appreciate this, uh, having the opportunity for the first time to talk to you about NVU. Um, I'll quickly do COVID. Uh, we're following the same opening procedures that you heard from Tom at Castleton. We were remote last week. Um, students were coming in anyway to occupy dorms. And of course, we also brought our athletes in. It was all basketball for us. And um, it was uh, somewhat um, challenging and disappointing because it wasn't just COVID affecting our students, it was COVID affecting other students. For example, another school we were supposed to play against ended up with 30 positives within one day. Um, so we had to cancel. And the other thing that was unique, and you'll have to love this, uh, there were two other schools in the Northeast Kingdom who had had games, had arrived here for multiple weekend games, had games canceled and called us up and said, hey, we're in the area, can you, can you put a team together? And we actually did that twice, um, scheduling, uh, I guess you could call them itinerant teams traveling through looking for a pickup game. Um, and we won uh, two of the three that we got out of that, even though they were unscheduled. Um, <clears throat> so uh, right now we're um, you know, having all our students pre-test and then arrive and they get a rapid test. We're continuing with our PCR testing in the week. Right now we have three students uh, fully isolated on campus out of the total. Um, and they're pouring in today. I'm sure we'll end up with a few more as they come in. Um, the parking lot in front of my office has had constant uh, exchange of materials and parents wheeling things to dorms as they uh, push to the last minute to show up. But that's uh, been a very <clears throat> positive aspect of our return. I want to say something also but about our students and the activities on campus. And this speaks to the hybrid nature of our student body. As um, um, Joyce mentioned, how many, how many students are interested in online? Well, our students that have poured in have just taken over the campus with activities. Uh, <clears throat> broom ball games in the evening, planning a winter carnival. They're out there building snowmen. Um, so, you know, again, you have to remember this. This is a, going to be a hybrid university, not just in delivery, not just in the way we do things behind the scenes, but remember our students will be hybrid and we got to serve all aspects of the Vermont community because our students want to be here face to face and engaged with the community. Um, the <clears throat> budget um, is looking good based on enrollments. We are 51% in the spring from last year and 62% and, uh, at the same time we were at 2020. Um, that's been, I wanna give a shout out to the legislators here who supported the critical occupations. Some of that's been uh, driven by those scholarships. For example, the early childhood education program has really jumped dramatically because of the support that's been given to those programs. And, um, I also want to mention, as uh, Tom gave the indication of the out-of-state students, our uh, out-of-state enrollments are still very strong and they're significant this year. Students uh, from out-of-state want to be here. And they're, of course, a significant driver of um, tuition revenue because of the what they pay for out-of-state. And that's shown by our residential counts now being up this spring. Um, and we'll have to see how that figures out once the end of the check-in comes this week. So that's also been a very positive 
We end up, when you look at full pay equivalents at this point for the spring compared to last year, we're up by 45 full pay equivalents. Um, and again, uh, looking at the fall, again, it's very early for us, but our uh, numbers are up in first year deposits over last year, uh, 21% and 22% over 2020. But of course, you don't count them until you get the head in the bed, as we say, with a residential college. Um, one of the highlights I wanted to point out um, for NVU, and it's going to be a highlight, I think, for VSU, was a program started before I got here, which was our learning and working community, where our students are given the opportunity to get uh, <clears throat> stipends and credit for internships and working in, the, uh, in their professional areas in the community. I also want to give a shout out to the Northeast Kingdom and how these businesses, profits and not-for-profits, have stepped in to take part in this process. And it's been a very big success. We started it last year. We had 27 students take part in the summer, 39 in the fall. And so that program is um, turning out to be a big success. And we're adding a new uh, companies and new uh, people every day to that um, partnership that we're developing, including with a new initiative that looks like it's going to be very significant with some of the Vermont Ski Area Association groups such as Jay Peak, who are very much engaged in us working out some workforce development and of course stackable credential programs for college credentials and college degrees with their employees. So that's also a very positive aspect of what's happening here. And um, the other thing that I wanted to mention along with that um, outreach is something I started when I got here and being a new person, I heard in the community uh, so much about, gee, what was happening to NVU? Because that's the community I'm in. Are you gonna be around? And you know, they heard a lot of negativity about when the announcements for shutdown came out. They didn't hear much about the commitment the legislation made through Act 74 and this board made to have these institutions stay, get investment and thrive. So I've been traveling as much as I can around the, the North uh, East Kingdom and beyond. I've hit seven school districts to, at this point. Um, I don't talk to the students. I talk to superintendents, principals and guidance councils to tell them we're here and we're here to stay. I've also gone to three service organizations in the region. I've actually been coerced into joining two of them once I showed up. So no good deed goes unpunished. And then I've also uh, been in four regional business headquarters uh, since I got here. Omicron completely stopped that in January, but I hope to get that restarted. And in every case, the institutions were very, very thankful to hear what we were doing, what VSU is going to become. And in fact, from that, two organizations have now jo started joining us for the working and learning community to be part of this process. So it's been a very positive um, uh, response from that outreach to, to tell people this is a viable and strong uh, program moving ahead. And, and I, they're all excited about the direction that we're heading. I haven't heard any negativity at all. And finally, just to mention another thing that's kind of special to me, because I've been involved in this for a long time, we're, we're celebrating Black History Month um, with Celebrate Black uh, Excellence. And it's being hosted by both our, uh, Lyndon and Johnson uh, diversity and equity groups. And we're um, asking people in the NVU community to submit examples of black excellence and we'll be posting that for the whole month to let people know we are committed to this DEI effort that, we're, that the whole system wants to pursue. So with that, I'll end. Uh, I stayed within my allotted time and I'll take any questions. Thank you, President Mills. Is there anyone who has any questions or suggestions or comments? Okay, well, thank you. I'm glad you're getting the word out into your region. Thank you very much. Uh, we have President Pat Moulton, Vermont Technical College. Great, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you all for your time and attention this afternoon. It's my pleasure to share with you what's happening here at Vermont Tech. 
I'll start with enrollment. Um, we have regained much of our loss last year due to COVID with our first year class this year. We're still down about 3% from last year, but the first year class is a little bit bigger and we're, we're happy about that. And we're, we're not ultimately where we wanna be for sure, but we are getting there. And as you've heard from the others, it's still very early, but next fall is looking really great. Uh, total applications are up 35% over last year. And it's exciting that uh, we're doing this work with EAB, but what I'm hearing from my admissions folks is most of these, the increase is Vermonters um, who are seeking out education, which is great news to hear. Um, and hopefully next fall, be what we were on track to in the December, in the fall of 19, uh, when we were looking for one of the best years we've had since I've been here, and then our friend COVID showed up and made a different plan. But uh, we're, it looks like we're going to get back to that level, hopefully, next year. We are releasing the first round of practical nursing acceptances this, uh, actually today and this week, along with dental, vet tech, uh, radiologic science, and, and those acceptances will be ex uh, reflected in the February 1st uh, report. I can say we are already... Uh, waitlisted for dental hygiene, rat, radi radiologic science, vet tech, and a few of the nursing sites, certainly not all, but that's a really good sign. Uh, we're usually not waitlisted this early, so we're, we're pretty happy about that. And I would just remind folks that we are uh, opening up 45 new nursing seats through a long-term care cohort that we're working on. And, um, and then we hope to have additional seats in uh, Linden, so we're hoping we're gonna be able to accept more students than, than normal this year, this next fall. So very excited about that. Um, COVID, uh, deja vu all over again, here we are. Um, everything seems to be changing with COVID on a daily basis, but uh, we're watching the, the protocols and we have required students to test before they came back. We had 59 students that tested positive, uh, most before the semester. So these are students who did not return. Um, last uh, Tuesday for classes, they had to isolate in place, or I believe now we're calling it recovery in place. Um, and so we, we had uh, those 59 positives right now. We have uh, uh, positives on campus, approximately four. These students are isolating in place in their rooms. Uh, if these students are ill, we will utilize the 14 isolation rooms we have in one dorm. But um, we know that in a lot of cases, students are testing positive, but they're not having symptoms. They're not ill. Um, and we are also asking anyone who tests positive to go home. And in most cases, they're able to go home. And if not, they're staying here and isolating. Uh, we still have mandated vaccines and mandated boosters for when students are eligible to get those. And most of them will start being eligible next month and, and later. Um, I'm just so incredibly pleased that we now have a full-time health services coordinator in Sarah Billingsburg, um, who's able to provide a lot more assistance to our students with COVID or uh, even our employees with COVID. And she's been doing a fabulous job on planning and developing flow charts. If you're positive, if you're negative, what do you do? Um, because it's very confusing now with a lot of the changed protocols and things like contact tracing, which are not happening is up to the individual. Uh, to do their own notification of any close contacts now. So much more of a personal responsibility shift in COVID, which um, is good as we start to shift into the endemic stage of this lovely uh, disease that we have. Um, as has been mentioned, you know, we're moving forward in transformation. We have dozens of folks working on transformation. I will say uh, they're struggling to get to stay on top of their regular work along with the transformation work. As an example, we usually get nursing decisions out a week earlier. We weren't able to do that because our, we have admissions folks who spent three days last week in a slate workshop. So um, I, I respect the question you asked Trustee Grinold in terms of time and effort, because that would be great to, to track, but a royal pain to track as well. Um, so, but uh, you know, I, we do have some ability to track, which I'm pleased that Sharon has. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about our Center for Agriculture and Food Entrepreneurship, the, the orange program we still have um, that is going slow, primarily for the need for funding and primarily because we just don't have the bandwidth to put the time in. We're basically got yours truly working part-time on this. 
Molly Willard working part-time because she has a full-time job and our department chair, agriculture department chair working part-time on this. So it's taking longer than we want. Uh, we do have three consultants working in three separate program areas. One is working on developing additional short courses in agriculture and a heavy focus on meat cutting and development of a meat cutting lab for us. We have a second that's working on the farm renovations and transformation that need to be to ha happen for us to really launch the Center for Agriculture and Food Entrepreneurship. And the third, who we hope to be hearing a close to final report from tomorrow, who's setting up internship program for us and has identified more than 50 sites that have expressed an interest in hosting interns, be they farms, be they food manufacturers, and others who are in the food supply chain who would like to host our interns. So I'm, I'm, I'm bolstered by that number. And um, that consultant is working on actually the internship manual and the whole, whole uh, kit and caboodle on that. As Yasmin said, we did submit a, a EDA grant application that last year that seeks three years of seed funding for the critical staff we need to get this off the ground, namely our director of the Center for Agriculture and Food Entrepreneurship, the internship coordinator, and a meat cutting lab tech lab director. Um, and we're hopeful for that EDA application. And I just don't know the timing. As Adam knows, EDA is hard to predict often on the timing. So um, and often moves like a slow, like molasses on a morning like this morning. But um, we also are hoping to submit, hope to get invited to submit an application to the Working Lands Enterprise Board to establish a meat cutting facility that can be dedicated to our programming. Our problem has been accessing those facilities because the Butchers and meat cutters have been letting us use that to hold classes are too busy to let us in with the frequency we'd like to be there. And we are actually looking at a possibility of leasing some space initially versus building brand new so we can really get things launched and be making some money before we actually invest in bricks and mortar. We are gonna have to look for another grant for farm renovations. We don't have that funding in place right now, but. Um, so that's a little bit more of an update on where we are on the Ag, um, Center for Ag and Food Entrepreneurship. I want to talk a minute for, about our Advanced Manufacturing Center. Um, we have an exciting visiting faculty member, Dr. Andreas Villanos. I'm not going to get his name right, but he is a world-renowned uh, world expert in additive design. Um, and he's co-teaching a mechanical engineering course for us this, this semester with Jeremy Cornwall. And, Additive design is something that employers uh, introduced us to early. It's one thing to design and build blueprints for a subtractive model where you're cutting out metal or plastics or whatever, but when you're building it for an additive building up 3D printing model, it's a different type of design and a different type of engineering. So he's doing that work for our existing students. We're hoping to set up some workshops on the same title topic for incumbent workers at manufacturers around the state who need that, that tutelage. Um, we're also working on a ribbon cutting date with Senator Leahy, hopefully in March. Um, we're still waiting also for last pieces of equipment in that center. The, things, the interest there has, is only growing pretty exponentially as more manufacturers in particular find out about the capacity we have there and wanna know more about our graduates. Um, we do have some nursing changes, nursing staffing changes. Sarah Billingsberg is now our full-time health services coordinator um, and still lending assistance when needed to the nursing program. But we're really pleased to say, uh, announce that Dr. Lisa Fox, who was one of our site directors, is now our new associate dean for nursing and doing a fantastic job. Uh, we're also working on hiring a nursing coordinator to assist Lisa. Um, we recognize we probably loaded a lot too much on Sarah's plate and that that work, particularly given the continued pressure to look at growing nursing, we need some additional support for an admin in that work. Um, we're also hiring a new administrative uh, assistant, executive assistant for nursing because Jerry Lynn Cohen retired this year. We're going to need to also refill Lisa's site director position in the Northwest. Uh, we still are looking for a site director in, in the Southwest. We have three full-time nursing faculty positions open. We have seven part-time clinical associates positions open. Um, it's, it's not easy right now hiring nursing faculty and staff. Um, as I mentioned, we're, we're growing the 40 new, 45 new positions in long-term care. 
and then we'll grow 60 new seats due to the partnership with Linden, with NVU and the Linden expansion, um, 60 new seats over the next three years, 20 seats a year that we'll, when that construction is finished. So another thing I'm really pleased to announce is once again, for the third year in a row, Despite COVID and remote learning and you name it, our nursing students exceeded the national NCLEX pass rates again this year for the third year in a row by you know, some decent margins in some case. In, in 2021, the national NCLEX pass rate for associate's degree nursing was 80.45%, the lowest in the history of the exam. And the national NCLEX practical nurse pass rate was 80%. At that time, however, Vermont Tech's pass rates were 86.7 for our associate degree students and 97.9 for our, excuse me, for our, our certificate students and 97.9 for our associate degree students. So we blew everybody out of the water on the NCLEX pass rate. So um, it can be done to Joyce Judy's point. You can learn remotely and you can do it and you can do it well. It's not the for first choice by some students, but um, particularly where you have heavy lab and um, lecture combination, and it's really hard to learn how to fly a plane without actually getting one or, or fix a car without actually putting a wrench on an engine and things of that nature. But um, our, our nursing students did very well. We're really pleased to hear that. Um, and we know, and we still achieved a 99% placement rate last year. So we're really pleased to hear that. Um, and as, as Tom Muspew said, it's really nice to see cars in the parking lot. It's nice to see students on campus. I will say though, Friday night, I kind of looked out at the parking lot and said, where'd everybody go? So um, I think so, folks are choosing to go home when they don't have to be here, uh, but we're, we're glad to be open and uh, operating and hope to stay that way, keeping our fingers crossed. So that's my update for now and I'm happy to answer any questions. Any further questions for President Moulton? Bill. So I, I, I just wanna say uh, how important the incredible work that's being done around nursing is um, and how much we in the House Healthcare Committee and the legislature generally uh, are looking to be supportive uh, because we recognize the partnership is so critical to the health, it's a really strained healthcare workforce in Vermont right now. Uh, the creative partnerships, uh, I hear about it when I uh, hear from the hospital association. Uh, they, uh, they tout the work that VTC is doing. Uh, and so uh, I think we should, we should just generally be pleased. There's a lot more for us to do and we're gonna do our part to try to see if we can't uh, continue to put resources behind the desire uh, to strengthen nursing uh, training uh, in Vermont. So, but thank you. Thank you, Trustee Lippert. And I just can't say enough again for the critical occupation scholarships last year, how that doubled our BSN population, our online uh, bachelor's degree and filled every nursing seat we have for the first time in about five years. So those, it, it shows that, you know, there are folks who are interested, but they need to find a way to afford it. So I'm very appreciative of the legislature's efforts last year and very much looking forward to working with you all this year to keep it going. So. You'll be hearing from us very soon. Excellent. <laughs> Anyone else have any questions? Bill, one more? No. Anyone else? Congratulations, Pat. It sounds like you've got a lot of good nursing students there and they're coming out quick and we need to get them out there as quickly as we can. So thank you. All well, of our critical sure, um, Tom Mospew and Helen Popica from Castleton would love to come talk with you too, Bill. So. Yes, yes. All of our, all of our critical uh, occupation uh, students who were able to get access, uh, affordable access to these schools, all of our schools, and all of our programs have been really key, mental health, nursing, many others, early childhood education, but, and uh, it is really, um, it shows you that there is a need and there is, um, there's a real groundswell of people who wanna take advantage of these. So it's a message for the legislature and the governor. I, I do wanna quickly flag that we've had some really productive conversations between Castleton and Vermont Tech as we think about nursing moving forward. So as we're coming together 
um, to create the new university. I just think it's really important that we support um, the efforts that, that they're making. So, um, yeah, just thank you to Tom and to Pat and then to, the, you know, Lisa and um, Helen, both at both institutions. Yes, yes. So the continuum is the stackable credentials and the continuum is really important. And that goes for many, many, many uh, programs and many occupations. But thank you, all of you. Um, anyone else have any more questions for, for, for Vermont Tech? Go ahead, Jim. Um, thanks. Um, Pat, I've heard from some nurse anesthetologists from out of state that they'd like to come back here. And there's a question about supervision in this state versus other states. And this is beyond the trustees scope of business, I guess you could say, but I'd like to have a conversation with you offline or afterwards or something about allies for, for bringing those folks here. Thanks. Love to, love to. You wanna give me a call, Jim, or you wanna want me to call you? Hey, Pat, either way. Okay. Um, Okay, that's anyone else? Okay, it appears that that is the reports from the presidents. We now have, um, is there any other additional business that we may have coming up right now? I'm seeing none. We have a, a link in the uh, chat. Yeah. Trustee Maslund had his hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, just apologize for being so late, folks. I've got too many things I'm trying to juggle and some days I don't do a good job of it. So nice to see you. Yeah, I'm glad you made it. Um, we do have a, a link in the chat for additional comments or public comments from anyone from the public. Is there anyone in there? Does Jen see anyone who has signed up or requested to make a comment? We do not have anyone signed up right now, but if there's anyone in the meeting that would like to make a comment, you can go ahead and raise your hand. I'm thinking we do not have anyone that wants to make a comment at this time, Chair Dickinson. Okay, well, thank you, Jen. Um, in that case, we will go and uh, I'll invite Vice Chair Kluver to make a motion to go into executive session. Uh, no formal or binding action will be taken in executive session. Uh, if we take action, it'll be after we exit executive session. So I move that the Board of Trustees enter executive session pursuant to 1 VSA 313A1B to discuss labor relations agreements with employees because premature general public knowledge would clearly place the public body involved at a substantial disadvantage. I further move that the board enter executive session pursuant to 1 VSA 313A3 to discuss the appointment and employment of a public officer. Along with the members of the board present at this meeting in its discretion, the board invites the chancellor, the general counsel, and the chief financial and operating officer to attend. Okay, we have a motion on the table. Is there a second? Uh, David seconding. David Silverman seconds it. Any discussion or comments? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor of going into executive session, please indicate by saying aye. It's now five aye. minutes after three. All aye. those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we will have a breakout room. Then you're muted. Okay, I think we have most everybody here now. We are um, coming out of execu executive session at 4.32 p.m. Um, I have a motion. Uh, just about everybody's here. All right, I move that the board vote to formally ratify the recently negotiated collective bargaining agreements with the CCV United Faculty and with the Part-Time Faculty Federation and that um, I'm authorized to sign each agreement on behalf of the VSC Board of Trustees as the chair of the board. Do I have a second on that? Second. Mary Moriana seconded that. Any discussion or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion is read. Please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Seeing none. Uh, we are now able to ask for an adjournment. Can someone please make a motion to that effect? 
So moved. Mary Moran. <laughs> Second. Jim. Jim Maslin. Okay, any questions or just discussions of that? Seeing none, we are, uh, all those in favor of adjourning, please indicate by saying aye. All right. Aye. 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 Thank you. Bye, Bye everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.